We're considering Markov transition semigroups that are as continuous as they could be. That is, their operator norm continuous at zero, which we've now established means that their operator norm continuous and differentiable everywhere on the positive real line. And in that case, there exists a bounded generator. We showed last time that in the case of a countable discrete state space, where that means that QT is given by a transition matrix for each T, we showed that the generator A is also given by a transition matrix. And that transition matrix is the derivative entry by entry of the transition kernel QT. Now, in this case, the semigroup itself is just given by exponentiating TA, which we can define by the power series expansion there, a series which converges uniformly in T in operator norm. And that means that we may as well consider this only to first order for what we're about to say. This is the identity plus TA plus terms of order T squared and higher. And so that means that the matrix QT has entries that are given by the entries of the identity matrix plus T times the entries of the generator plus terms of order T squared and higher. What does that tell us? Well, if XT is a Markov chain with transition kernels given by those QT, what that says is of course that in this discrete setting, QT is the conditional probability that X at time T is J, given at the starting time X zero, its state is I. So that's equal to delta IJ plus T A of IJ plus higher order terms. That says that these AIJs are transition rates for the process. In particular, if I is not equal to J, so that this term is zero, that says that the probability that XT is in state J, given that X zero is in state I, is for small t approximately AIJ times T. So the probability of jumping from state i to state j increases with time, at least for small time, and it increases at an approximately linear rate, where that rate is the entry a i j in the generator matrix. More precisely, what we have exactly is that the derivative of this transition probability at time zero is a i j, which is exactly what we proved in the last lecture. Now for this reason, this entire regime that we're talking about where we have a discrete state space and operator norm continuity for our transition semigroup is called the case of bounded rates. And to understand exactly where that term comes from, let's recall that this continuity condition in this context precisely means that the infimum of the diagonal entries of the transition matrix tends to one as T goes down to zero. And what that means about A is the following. If I take the operator norm of the generator, which as we know is the max row sum, that that's gonna be finite, but that is the supremum of separating this out into J not equal to I and J equal to I. When J equals I, we get the absolute value of the diagonal term and for all of the others, we have the absolute values of those terms. But as we pointed out last time, all of these terms are positive. And moreover, all of the row sums are zero, which means that this term is negative. And so this is the negative of the diagonal entry. And that means that this is actually equal to this once again. So this just gives twice the supremum over i of the absolute value of AII, which is the negative of AII. So we see that this condition on the asymptotic behavior of the matrix near zero equates to its derivative at zero, the generator, having diagonal entries that are uniformly bounded. Now it may feel to you that over the last three or four lectures, we've transitioned from a course in probability to a course in basic functional analysis. 
That's not my intent. We've used some tools of basic functional analysis to get to a point now where we can say something very probabilistically meaningful. And that is in terms of what this generator actually tells us about the behavior of our Markov chain. The generator totally determines the behavior of the Markov chain, at least in terms of its finite dimensional distributions, which in the case of a discrete space is pretty much all we can say. But how does it describe that behavior? Exactly how does it determine it? To answer that, we're going to make a clever affine change of variables. First, let's take our generator, which we know has a matrix, little a. We can rescale that, and it's still the generator of a Markov chain. In fact, it's a very closely related Markov chain. If I take a and divide it by some positive number lambda, then that generates a new transition semigroup whose generator is 1 over lambda times a. But of course, that's just the original semigroup at time t over lambda. It's just a time rescaled semigroup. It's moving faster if lambda is bigger than one or slower if lambda is less than one, but it's just the same semigroup sped up or slowed down. So that's still a generator. And now what happens if we add the identity matrix to that? Okay. Well, that's not gonna be a generator anymore because this one has to have row sums equal to zero, whereas this one has row sums equal to one, because there's a one in each one of those rows added to the old one. But having row sums equal to one means that it looks more like a transition matrix, and in fact it is. First, let's note that this is still a bounded operator. If I take that matrix P, its max row sum norm is less than or equal to the max row sum norm of the identity operator plus the max row sum norm of 1 over lambda times a, and all of those are finite. If I take lambda larger than 1 half the operator norm of a, which as we showed on the last slide is just equal to the supremum of the absolute diagonal entries, then that tells us that the diagonal entries of p are 1 plus the diagonal entries of A divided by this number, which is larger than any of the absolute values of those. And so that thing is, no matter how negative AII is, greater than or equal to zero for all I, because AII divided by lambda in absolute value is less than or equal to one. And as we noted just a moment ago, the row sums there are all one. So I have a bounded matrix P whose row sums are one and all of whose diagonal entries are non-negative, but its off diagonal entries are just one over lambda times the off diagonal entries of A, which are also non-negative. So P satisfies all the conditions that we need. It is a bounded stochastic matrix and that means that it is the one-step transition operator for some discrete time Markov chain, which we'll call Yn, on that same discrete state space. Okay, great. But what on earth does that have to do with our original semigroup and a Markov chain whose transitions are governed by that original QT? So here is the main theorem that I've been aiming towards. Let Yn be a Markov chain with this as its one-step transition matrix. Now let's take a Poisson process with rate. Now let's take a Poisson process with intensity lambda, any lambda sufficiently big in order to make this work. And let's choose that Poisson process independent from that Markov chain Yn. Then we can do this funny thing. We can take that discrete time Markov chain and compose it in the time variable with the Poisson process. Look at this time changed chain, y at time nt. That gives us a continuous time stochastic process. The theorem is that that is a continuous time Markov process and its generator is A. In other words, we started with a transition semigroup QT and we can construct a Markov chain with that QT as its transition semigroup in this funny way. 
by taking some discrete time Markov chain and composing it in the time variable with an independent Poisson process. That gives us a really interesting probabilistic description of what all bounded rate continuous time Markov chains look like. We're going to prove that now, but first let's restate the theorem in a slightly different format. Let A be a bounded Markov generator on a discrete space with matrix little a. Let lambda be a sufficiently large positive parameter. And let Yn be a Markov chain whose one-step transition operator is given by this operator P, identity plus 1 over lambda times the generator A. If nt is a Poisson process with intensity lambda that is independent from that Markov chain, then the time changed yNt continuous time process is actually a Markov process, and it has a as its generator. And in this context here, reversing the relationship, a is equal to lambda times p minus the identity. So the key to this observation is just doing a simple computation here with a given like this, e to the ta, which makes perfect sense because a is bounded, is e to the lambda t times p minus the identity. Now p and the identity matrix commute with each other, and so we can use the exponential property and pull out an e to the minus lambda t times the identity, which is just the constant e to the minus lambda t, times e to the lambda t p. Now let's expand that in the power series. That's e to the minus lambda t times the sum, n going from 0 up to infinity, of lambda t to the n over n factorial times p to the n. And we'll just note that the terms here in the sum are exactly the probability mass function of a Poisson random variable, which, due to the time homogeneity of the Poisson process, are equal to the probability that the increment nt plus s minus ns is equal to n in the sum. We're going to leverage that several times in the following calculations. What we're about to do is compute all of the finite dimensional distributions of this process xt defined in terms of this time change of the discrete process y. What that means is that we need to compute for all possible finite sequences of times, t0 through tk, where traditionally t0 is 0, and all possible sequences of states, i0 through ik, What's the probability of the event that x0 is in state i0, xt1 is in state i1, all the way up to xtk is in state ik? Now, because of this relationship between x and y, in order for, say, xt1 to equal i1, what that means is that the Poisson process n at time t1 takes some value n1, and that we're looking at the event that y n1 equals i1. And so all we have to do is sum by the law of total probability over all possible n1s of the event that yn1 equals i1 and nt1 equals n1. But because the Poisson process is independent from the process y, that probability of the conjunction of two events factors into these two probabilities. Now we have to keep going, of course, because we have an and here, the next term as well. And that grows exactly the same way. The only thing to note is that because the Poisson process is increasing, when we sum over all of the discrete times little n2, such that the Poisson process at time t2 is little n2, those n2s have to be bigger than or equal to n1 because we conditioned on the event that nt1 was equal to little n1. And so at the end of the day, using the independence and this law of total probability, we express this as a sum over all of those k increasing sequences of non-negative integers of these probabilities times these probabilities. And now we're going to do computations on both of these terms separately. Here we're going to use the Markov property to express all of these in terms of the transition matrix P. And here we're going to write in terms of increments. And we'll see that those two things will fit together exactly in this formula. Let's start with that increment description. The probability that the Poisson process at time t1 is n1, at time t2 is n2, 
all the way up to a time tk is nk, can be rewritten like this. We just note that taking the last two times, tk and tk minus one, if we've already established the values at time t1 up to tk minus one, we can replace that with the event that the increment ntk minus ntk minus one is the difference, nk minus nk minus one. But we know that the increments of the Poisson process are independent. And in particular, this increment is independent of the process up to time tk minus one. So this probability factors, that's the probability of nt1 equaling little n1 up to ntk minus one equaling little n k minus one times the probability that this last increment is equal to that difference. And of course, that's just a Poisson random variable mass function there. Now let's look at the other part of the terms. We need to look at the probability that the discrete Markov chain at time zero is in state I zero, at time N one is in state I one and so on. Using our notation for Markov processes, that's the same as looking at this, the probability of the generic process starting in state I zero of this event here. And now we use the formula for the finite dimensional distributions of any Markov chain in terms of its transition kernels. Now in this discrete setting, where we're looking at just individual states that it gets to rather than a set of states that we're getting to, that formula, which is in general a multiple integral of these kernels, is just a product of matrix entries. That is, we take the probability that we're in state I0 at time zero, times the transition probability of the chain y from zero to n1, going from state i0 to i1, times the transition kernel from n1 to n2, going from state i1 to i2, all the way down the line. And the reason I write this out is just to note that if we stop at the second last entry, all of these together, by the same reasoning, just give us the probability starting in state i that yn1 is i1 through ynk minus 1 is ik minus 1. And so we get this nice factorization that this probability is the probability one step earlier times this. But as we've calculated earlier, because this is a time homogeneous process with generator matrix P, that is equal to the nk minus nk minus one power of the matrix P, ik minus one ik entry. And so putting all those things together with the law of total probability sum from the last slide that says that this general finite dimensional distribution quantity that we want to calculate is this sum here, which we can write by taking this term times this term, that's here, times this term times this term, that's here. And in order to make that equality, all I've done is to rename nk minus nk minus one equal to m. The range of those m's is therefore zero up to infinity because in this sum, nk is anything bigger than or equal to nk minus one. Now this sum here, take a look, that's exactly this, which is the semigroup at time tk minus tk minus one. So that sum inside there amounts to e to the tk minus tk minus one a, the matrix of that at states ik minus one and ik. Okay, now we've done one step, now we do induction and what we find is that this probability here that we wanted to calculate amounts to this product, the product of these exponentials at the increment times of the generator A at these states over all of those chain of states that we were interested in. Of course, that's exactly Q TL minus one up to TL of IL minus one up to IL. And that's exactly what it means to be a Markov process, as we saw with transition kernel QT, that those finite dimensional distributions are given by 
these products. And so we have shown the conclusion that we were hoping to show. So that's very interesting. Every bounded rate continuous time Markov chain on a discrete space is a Poisson process time change of a discrete chain. So we really only need to understand discrete chains in order to understand the continuous ones, at least in this bounded case. Now, that doesn't mean that we're most of the way there because as we'll look a little bit into in the near future, discrete time chains can be very, very complicated. But at least it tells us that the continuous time chains can be understood in an elementary way. And in fact, in the next lecture, we're going to see even more precisely a characterization theorem for them called the jump hold description, which really reduces the study of continuous time chains to discrete time chains. But before we get there, let me make one precise comment about what kind of Markov process this is. What we showed is that the finite dimensional distributions of this Poisson process time change of a discrete chain matches those of a Markov process with this as its transition semigroup. That means that XT is a Markov process. It's a Markov process with respect to the filtration that it generates. But in some cases, we would rather have a filtered probability space to start with and show that something is an adapted Markov process. Now that's gonna be quite a bit more challenging here when we're talking about a time change here. What is the natural filtration? Because we started not with a continuous time filtration, but with a discrete time filtration for the discrete Markov chain Yn. So if we track through all of those details very carefully, we can state the theorem in the following more precise way. If we start with a filtered probability space filtered by a discrete filtration and choose a Yn discrete time adapted time homogeneous Markov chain on a countable state space, whose one-step transition operator is given by some matrix P. And if we let NT be a Poisson process with intensity lambda independent from the union of the filtration, that is the sigma field generated by the union of all of those FNs, then we can define a new filtration, GT, which is defined as follows. A subset B of the probability space omega is in the filtration at time t if and only if for all natural numbers n the intersection of b with the event that the Poisson process takes value n at time t is in the sigma field generated by the Poisson process at time t and the filtration at time n. It's a fairly tedious exercise to show that this defines a continuous time filtration on the original probability space. And that this time changed process, xt, given by y composed with nt, is adapted to that filtration. Once you do that, the same calculations we just did show that that time changed ynt has as its transition semigroup this. In other words, its generator is indeed lambda times p minus the identity. I'm not going to go through all of those details, but if you're interested, they're spelled out very carefully in driver's notes.